Hello and welcome to another Budget Builds episode where today we'll be taking a look at the NVIDIA GeForce 8600 GTS. Now this may sound familiar to you as we previously tested the NVIDIA GeForce 8600 GT, actually the inspiration for this channel. The graphics card that cost us just 25 pence. Well of course today this card costs us 10 times as much, a massive £2.50. The card itself boasts support for DirectX 10 and comes complete with 256MB of GDDR3 VRAM. Only half of that of the GT version we tested so little ago. However, the card has a core clock speed of 675MHz and memory clocks of 1010MHz. Definitely not bad at all. To put this into perspective, it gave us a 3D mark score of 3675. So far, not too bad. And to put this into perspective against the 25P card, that only scored 1339. So far, double the score. Originally retailing for around 200 US dollars or 180 pounds upon its release in April 2007, the card had quite a hefty price tag due to the weak price performance that was going on in this era, and it really plagued the market at the time. The card does, however, need a 1 6 pin connector to supply its TDP of 71 watts. Some more specifications about the card we've shown below should you wish to find out a little bit more. The card was released on the 80 nanometer process and came with a lot of variations. Of course, today we have the palette version, which isn't really stellar in any way, but should give an idea of how it performances across all these types of cards. But let's see how it performs in games. Up first with Grand Theft Auto 5. We're in the game here in the lowest settings possible at a resolution of 720p. This gave us an average of around 10 FPS, and although the gameplay wasn't subject to too much stuttering, as seen by the minimums only ever dropping down to 9 FPS, I wouldn't really be safe to say that this was a playable experience. Although the resolution was in HD, it looked alright, but not great. Dropping the resolution down to 480p, on the other hand, gave us a very similar experience, and this is likely due to the 256MB of VRAM the card has, and that's likely causing the low FPS we've seen here. Once again, the game was not stuttering, as shown by our minimums only being 3fps below our average at 14fps. However, when we removed shadows from the game, we saw that things began to look much better for the card, with averages hitting around 27fps and the game feeling overall much smoother as a whole. This is due to it being over that 24fps threshold many people beg to say is cinematic. With a few more tweaks, you'd likely be able to ensure the game was way more playable than this, although for the most part, our game did actually stay above 30fps, with only driving through cities bringing down that average. As I mentioned, driving was where our minimum touched that 20 FPS, which compared to the game beforehand was still a lot better than I would have anticipated. Graphics usage during this time playing was pegged at 100%, which means the only real weakness was the card itself, not the drivers. Although a sort of playable experience from a £2.50 card, I was impressed at this point. Next up was Counter-Strike GO, which we ran the game at its defaults of low with a resolution of 720p and it gave us quite the playable experience to say the least. Although it wasn't as nice as other cards at this price point, it was definitely more than playable, with an average of 56 FPS and it only ever dipping below this to a minimum of 46 FPS when the game got really hectic. Lowering the resolution or even running in DirectX 8 mode would likely boost your FPS just a little bit, which is very useful in a competitive game such as Counter-Strike GO. With performance like this in CSGO, it's pretty clear to see that the card is more than capable when it needs to be. The same kind of performance can be expected in all kinds of source games, and for £2.50, the performance was quite nice. The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim yielded an average of around 30 FPS, with visuals set to the medium preset. The game looked slightly nicer than the Xbox 360 port of the game, but did not retain the smoothness of that variant, as the VRAM here is clearly a major limiting factor. Moving into towns or cities would slow the game down to around 24 FPS, with the occasional stutter down to 18 FPS at the very worst. That did become our minimum as our time playing, and although not a bad experience, you may have to lower some settings to achieve a constant 30 FPS. Crisis, when running on a low preset with a resolution 720p, returned us an average of around 30 FPS. During this, we had one of our stutters down to a minimum of 20 FPS, which still wasn't too bad. Although the game still looked pretty nice on the low preset, and it was a playable experience, so yes, we can play Crisis on a £2.50 card. Gunfights and driving didn't differ our FPS at all, and the game just felt smooth. I'd imagine performance like this would be very similar in most games if we had to add slightly more VRAM. Far Cry 3 at 720p with low settings ran at an average of 20 FPS, which dipped down to 19 FPS at the very worst. Still, a very slightly less than playable experience. 
However, dropping that resolution down to 800 by 600 gave us an average of around 30 FPS, which was much more than playable. Although not quite matching the visuals of a last gen console, the game looked and ran fine at 800 by 600. And even when in action, we had no issues at all with the game, and it ran just perfectly, really. It wasn't a terrible experience, and we did get one stutter down to around 20 FPS but at this price point, I class that as acceptable. Finally, Just Cause 2 ran perfectly fine on medium settings with some of the more demanding settings turned down to low, with averages of 35 FPS and the occasional dip down to 20 FPS during the most intense part of benchmarking, it can be seen that the card can handle particle effects really well, which is what DirectX 10 is all associated with, and really its VRAM limit is the main constraint, especially in those modern titles. So do I recommend this card? Well, yes and no. Yes, at the price point of £2.50, it's still very good, and the support for such an old card driver-wise was really well. It was able to be installed onto a modern system quite easily, really. I mean, I've had trouble with older cards, and they just, they just wouldn't install. I've had to mess around with driver utilities, stuff like that. I had no issues with that here. Meanwhile, it's got two DVI-I ports on the back, which allows you to run two at digital or analog monitors, which makes it ideal for those wanting to run an older monitor array, or just something like that. It also has S-Video output, so you connect it to a CRT TV, something that you might enjoy if you're an enthusiast of the technology. And of course, it has a TDP low enough to run on most systems of only 71 watts, which isn't half bad, really. But price performance wise, it wasn't too great. I mean, even when it came out, it still had high price and low power. And over time, that stigma hasn't really changed. And although you can purchase this card, the 8600 GT variant costs 10 times less. And for only £18 more, the R7250 offered multitudes better performance while consuming even less power and having better driver support and even modern API support but it's ready for the future where this isn't. But really, it depends on what card you can find lying around in your area. Performance is around 25% better than that of the 8600 GT, but a massively inflated cost, I'd have to say either spend less and go for the 8600 GT or spend more and go for the R7250. Or if your power supply can handle it, why not look into purchasing a used HD4890, which we've seen has been the king of price to performance on the UK used market. So thank you very much for watching, good night! And if you found this video interesting, why not take a look at some of my other videos?